The Lord is risen. He is risen risen indeed. indeed. Good morning. Welcome to Wilmington Island Presbyterian Church on this most special of days as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Whether this is your first time or you rarely miss a Sunday, whether you're here in person or online, welcome this morning. For those of you here in the sanctuary, please find and fill out the friendship pads at the end of each pew, and please take note of those who are worshiping with you this morning. You will see in the church bulletin, there's a lot going on in the life of the church. Lots of opportunities for spiritual growth and service and fellowship. We hope you will join us for some or all of these things as we seek to deepen our relationship with God and with one another. Are there any other announcements that need to be made here this morning? Let us center our hearts to worship the Lord. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O God, that your Son is alive and the world has never been the same. We celebrate that the stone has been rolled away and the tomb is empty. And Christ our Lord is risen, bringing new life to all who call upon his name. Listen to our voices as we sing forth our praises. Hear our shouts of adoration as we enter the courtyards of your redeeming grace. For you are indeed a mighty and gracious God, and your steadfast love endures forever. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen and reigning Lord. Amen. Please stand in body or spirit for the call to worship. Friends, the tomb is empty. The stone has been rolled away. For Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Thanks be to God, who gives us victory throughout our risen Lord. For God's love cannot be contained by anything, not even death. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? For Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Come, let us worship the risen Christ. Our opening hymn this Easter morning is hymn 232, Jesus Christ is Risen Today.
Come, for all who seek the Lord shall find him. All who call upon his name shall be heard. For the power that brought back Jesus from the dead is the same power that is, is at work in us, transforming us into new creations. Let us come before the throne of grace, seeking the forgiveness that Christ has won for us on the cross. Let us pray. Almighty God, in raising Jesus from the grave, you shatter the power of sin and death. Yet we confess that there are times in which we live as though Christ has not been raised. We allow our doubts and fears to hold us captive, preferring the darkness rather than the light of this new day. Forgive us, O Lord, and help us to more fully trust in your power and your love. Change our hearts and make us new creations so that we may know the joy of the abundant and eternal life given in Christ, Christ our risen Lord. Amen. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone of our faith. And all who call upon the name of the risen Christ shall be saved and transformed into new creations. The old life is gone and a new life begun. This is the good news we celebrate this day and every day, that in the name of Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. You may be seated, except for the children who are with us. Kids of the kingdom, come on down. You guys coming down? Come on down. Okay, okay. Good morning. Happy Easter. So my question, how many of you were here for our Easter egg hunt yesterday? Raise your hand. You found a lot of eggs, didn't you? Yeah. I know, but you didn't find all of them. I think I found some more. So I'm going to give everyone one, but hold, don't open it yet. Okay, I know you found one this morning. So one for you, one for you, one for you, one for you. You want the golden one? Okay, one golden one for you, one for you, one for you. You get the Shrek one. One for you, and one for you. Oh, not, not that one. How about this one? Okay. These are very special eggs. Some eggs have candy in them. Some are spiritual eggs like this. So on the count of three, I want you to open it and tell me what you find inside. One, two, three. Nothing. Maybe check this one. Check that one. Anything in that one? Nothing. Anyone? Nope, nope, nothing there. Those are the ones from the youth group. These are the youth group ones? Oh, you're right. I think the youth ate all the candy out of them, don't you? I think you're right. No, these are special eggs. Why do you think I might have given you an empty egg? What are we celebrating today? Easter. Easter. And what, did, what happened on that first Easter morning? What the tomb was? Empty, just like these eggs are empty. So these eggs remind us that Jesus is not dead. He is alive because the tomb was empty, just like these eggs are empty. So some of you were at our Easter egg hunt yesterday. How many of you have an Easter egg hunt today? How many of you got an Easter basket from the Easter Bunny? How many of you got lots of candy? 
No, you didn't get pots of candy? Some? You haven't had yours yet? I have. Okay, okay. Because candy is one of the best parts of Easter. But this is even better because these are special eggs. So put these eggs in your Easter baskets, empty eggs, to remind you that Jesus is not dead. The tomb is empty just like these eggs. And so Jesus is alive. And that's what we are celebrating on Easter, that Jesus is alive. He's out there in the world. He lives in our hearts. He's still at work in the same power that brought Jesus back from the dead, that made the tomb empty. That same power is at work in our lives and the world all around us. So have fun today. Eat lots of chocolate and jelly beans and good food. But remember what we're celebrating. The tomb was empty and Jesus is alive. Absolutely. Will you say a prayer with me? So let's put our hands together, bow our heads and close our eyes. Thank you, God, for Easter, for celebrations, and most of all, for your son, Jesus, who died for us and is alive for us, for the tomb is empty. Help us remember this every day. Amen. All right, guys, thanks for coming up. You can go back to your seats, and we'll see you soon. Happy Easter.
I need to drink water, sorry. <laughs> Welcome to this most special day. We're glad that everyone is here today in the sanctuary and online. We greet you in the name of the risen Christ this day. Now, before we dive into our message this morning, let us start with the audience participation part of our program. Thank you, thank you. You know, you've heard that before. Da, 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 two and you know there's words to it. Shave and a haircut, two bits. You got it. Keep that in mind. It'll come in handy a little later in the sermon. But before we get into things, let us come before the Lord. Let us unite our hearts in prayer. Lord, open our hearts and our minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you have to say to us this day. We ask this in the name of our risen Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning we're going to actually hear two of the four gospel accounts of that very first Easter morning some 2,000 years ago. And we begin with John's gospel, the last of the four gospels. And his story of that first Easter begins in the 20th chapter. So let us hear this word from God. John writes, Early on that first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other, disciples who re the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scriptures that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their home. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and saw and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But I go to, my bro but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The word of the Lord. I imagine, if you've been coming to Easter services over the years, you have probably heard that passage from John's Gospel read more than any of the other Gospel accounts of that first Easter morning. And partly because it's, it's such a great story. Mary has gone alone to the tomb, 
And she finds that the stone has been rolled away, so she runs back and gets a couple of the disciples. She gets Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, we are told, who then run to the tomb themselves. And that other disciple kind of peers in. Then Peter actually goes in and sees that the tomb is empty, that the linen cloths are kind of wrapped and over there by side. Then the other disciple goes in, he sees, and he believes, John tells us. Now, what he believes, we're not exactly sure, because John follows that up by saying they, the disciple didn't really know what was going on because they didn't understand the scriptures that said that he must rise from the dead. At any rate, those disciples, those two disciples, return to their homes, but Mary is left there all alone, or so she thought. She has a conversation with the risen Christ, although she doesn't know it's the risen Christ at that point, until Jesus calls her by name. And as soon as she hears that Mary that she'd heard so many times before as one of Jesus' followers, then she recognizes him and calls him Rabboni, my teacher. And she runs to embrace him, but, but Jesus tells her, now go tell those other disciples that I am alive, that I've risen from the tomb. And Mary does exactly that. She runs from that tomb, finds the disciples, and tells them, I have seen the Lord. And that's a, a good story, isn't it? It's a great story. It's the most wonderful ending to the most wonderful story the world has ever known. That Jesus was dead, but now is alive, and God's love has conquered even the powers of death. And it's such a great story. That's why we're here this morning, to, to tell and to retell that story, to, to share that story, to reflect on that story and what it means to each and every one of us. And John does such a great job of telling that story. That's the one we normally turn to on this Easter Sunday. And then there's Mark's version of the story. What are we going to make of that? Let me give you a little context. I believe this is the 20th Easter sermon I preach from this pulpit. And most often I preach from John's gospel. Occasionally I have preached my Easter sermon from Matthew's gospel and occasionally from Luke's gospel. But in the 20 years I've been here, I have yet to preach on Mark's gospel until today. So once again, I invite you to hear God's word. This time as it comes to us from the 16th chapter of Mark's gospel, hear this word from God. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb they had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us at the entrance to the tomb? And when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has been raised and is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go tell the disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee, where you will see him, just as he told you. So they, those women, went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The word of the Lord. As we just heard, Mark's version starts off in much the same way that John's 
version does, except there's multiple women there instead of just Mary Magdalene. And they're wondering what they're going to do with the stone that's covering the grave. So they go and then they find the stone has been moved. And when they peek inside, they see a, a young man dressed in a white robe, an angel, sitting there. And the angel says, don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He is not here. He has been raised from the dead. And sure enough, as they look over that empty space where just a couple days earlier they had laid Jesus' dead body, the body wasn't there anymore. And then the angel says, go and tell the disciples that he, the risen Christ, is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him as he told you. But instead of going tell, to tell the disciples, instead of telling anyone, the women went out from the tomb, and Mark tells us that they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The end. That's how Mark probably ended his gospel. And now maybe you know why. This is probably the last one I would normally turn to to preach on this Easter Sunday. There is no appearance of the risen Christ. We have an angel, but no risen Christ. And we have women who are told to go and tell everyone that he is risen. And they go and tell no one that he is risen. I mean, what kind of Easter story is that? I mean, it seems incomplete, unfinished. So much so that other well-intentioned Christians over the years have tried to, to add a better ending, to write a better ending than Mark gave us. If you're following along in the Bibles in front of you in your pews, or if you have a good study Bible at home, you might notice that right after the part that I read, there's, it says, shorter ending of Mark, and then a little later it says, the longer ending of Mark. Again, these are in, well-intentioned Christians trying to write a better ending for what Mark gave us. The shorter ending of Mark doesn't even sound like Mark at all. It doesn't sound like any of the Gospels. And the longer ending of Mark sounds like that writer tried to, you know, pick and choose a little bit extra to put in to make it sound a little better. Pick a little bit from Matthew and put it in there. Pick a little bit of John and put it in there. Pick a little bit of Luke and put it in there to make it sound better. A better ending. But then if you were to keep reading, and I encourage you to do this later... At home, you know, read and you'll find a Bible at home and see if it has these things. Because then there's usually a little footnote at the end that says something like, Some of the most ancient authorities bring the book to a close with verse 8. That's where we ended. My study Bible on my desk says that. These endings, the longer and shorter ending of Mark, are missing from the earliest, most reliable Greek manuscripts. In other words, those well-intentioned Christians were trying to write a better ending to Mark because Mark, the way Mark ends at verse 8, it just sounds incomplete. But most biblical scholars believe that where I ended with verse 8 is where Mark ends originally ended his gospel. He ended his gospel with those women fleeing from the tomb and telling no one about what they had heard and seen. Which leaves us with a question. Why? Why would Mark choose to end his gospel in this way. No, 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 this time. He left it incomplete. Any fans of the Big Bang Theory? 
Raise your hand. It's only on like 82 times a day. So I'm guessing you probably, even when you're fixing dinner or just relaxing, you probably turned on the Big Bang Theory. And one of the main characters is Sheldon Cooper, who, shall we say, is a bit quirky. Brilliant, but quirky. And one of the kind of running gags throughout this series is that Sheldon can't leave things unfinished. I mean, there's whole episodes written about how he's tried to change that, but he just can't. In fact, you know, if you watch the show, you know he always is going across the hall to his neighbor, Penny, and when he goes to his neighbor, Penny, what does he do? Penny, Penny, Penny. Always three times, always three knocks, always saying the name Penny. In fact, if Penny opens the door too soon, after only the second time going through that, what does he do? Penny. He has to complete it. Maybe there's something about Sheldon that's about us as, t as well. And it's not just TV characters. Franz Liszt was one of the greatest composers and pianists that the world has ever known, as the world has ever known. But like many of us, he often had a hard time getting out of bed in the morning. But he had a lovely wife. And the lovely wife would be downstairs waiting for him to come down for breakfast. And when he wouldn't come, she would go over to the piano, which was downstairs, and play a simple scale. Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti. And she would stop. And Franz Liszt would hear that lying in bed, and he would, you know, try to ignore it, but he couldn't. So he would roll out of bed, put on his robe, go downstairs, hit that last note, do. And by that time, breakfast was ready, and he was out of bed. I would argue that there's something inside every one of us. Not just quirky sitcom characters, not just famous composers, who crave resolution, that crave completion, that we can't just let something sit there unfinished. Now you can do it, yes. And I think Mark knew this. I think Mark was very intentional in the way he ended his gospel. I think he was telling us the story of Easter and just leaving it unfinished. Just like things get unfinished in life. And it just kind of sits at us. It gnaws at us, just like it did for Sheldon Cooper, just like it did for Franz Liszt. There's something about hearing that story on this first Easter morning in which it's unfinished. If those women hadn't told anyone that Christ had risen, then someone must do it. And according to Mark, I think with a big wink at us, he says it's up to you and to me to finish that story, to finish the proclamation of this event. The women didn't do it, according to Mark, so it's up to us. And I think this is especially interesting when you compare the ending of Mark with what takes place in the rest of of Mark's gospel, in which Jesus is often telling people, don't tell the things that you are seeing. Don't tell others about what's happening. He heals a leper. The leper's so excited to be healed, and Jesus tells him, don't tell anyone else. He raises a daughter of a, a prominent person in the town, and he tells the parents, who are elated that their daughter was dead and now is alive, he tells them, don't say a word to anyone. There's a man who is deaf and dumb, and, and Jesus heals him. And all these people see it in this town, and Jesus tells all those town people, but don't say a word to anyone. And then, in the middle of Mark's gospel, something happens. Jesus takes Peter and James and John, and he goes to this high mountain, just with those three disciples. And while he was on this high mountain, his face begins to shine. His robe turns this 
bright white, unlike any other white color that anyone had ever seen. Suddenly, Moses and Elijah are standing there next to Jesus. And a cloud overshadows them all. And then this voice comes out of the cloud. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Now, in Mark's gospel, this is as close as we come to seeing a vision of the risen Lord. And Peter and James and John, if they had any doubts before this, they don't have any doubts after this. And you imagine that they just want to go and tell everyone what they had just seen. But Jesus tells them, don't tell anyone. Until, this time he puts a condition on it, until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. When that day comes, Jesus probably would have said, then go and tell everybody. Which makes the ending of Mark that much more strange. Jesus throughout the gospel says, don't tell, don't tell, don't tell. But now he is risen from the dead. And the angel says, go and tell everyone. But those women didn't say a word. Because they were afraid. It's left incomplete. And it's even stranger because when Jesus told that leper, don't tell anyone, what did the leper do? He told everyone. When he told those parents, don't say anything to anyone, they told everyone. When they told that town who had witnessed that miracle, don't say anything to anyone, they started talking to, to the point where Jesus had to leave that town because there were so many people coming to see and hear and observe what he was doing. So when these women were told to tell everyone that the risen Christ was alive, they told no one because they were afraid. Which means that if the story is going to be resolved, if it's ever going to come to its completion, if we're ever going to have that happy ending we all long for, it will be up to us. Shave and a haircut. Two bits. That two bits is us. It's our job to go forth this day to share this awesome, amazing news that Jesus was dead but now is alive. That death has been conquered once and for all by God's love. That God's power, God's love brought Jesus back to life. And that same power and that same love is at work in the world and in our lives today. Which means that there is nothing, nothing Nothing in our lives, nothing in the world that is beyond God's saving grace, that is beyond hope, that is beyond healing, that is beyond the redemption won for us in Jesus Christ our Lord. And why is that? Because the Lord is risen Shave and a haircut. Amen. Amen. My friends, I invite you to stand in body or in spirit for our hymn, Alleluia, Alleluia, Give Thanks.
and you may be seated. We come now to our time of celebrations and concerns. As always, we begin with celebrations. What do we have to celebrate in our midst? Besides, the Lord is risen. Thank you. Yes. 23rd wedding anniversary today. A safe arrival from parts from afar for Bailey and and that Carter's here too. So we're we're happy, happy family today. Are there other celebrations? We also have our list of concerns printed in the bulletin. We want to remember those who are struggling with illnesses, struggling with grief, struggling with decisions in their lives, just struggling. Are there others to add to our list or those or updates to be given? Yes. My granddaughter, Callie, is in the hospital at Memorial. Just found out this morning. Mary's granddaughter, Callie, is at Memorial Hospital, and that's about all we know at this point. So please keep Callie and her family in your prayers. Are there others? Then I invite you to join me as we come before the Lord, as we unite our hearts in prayer. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious God, on this day we celebrate the resurrection of your Son. And with the heavens and the earth, we lift our voices with shouts of alleluia. By raising your Son, you destroyed sin and death once and for all and gave us the power to be victorious in our own lives. So Lord, continue to guide us in the paths of eternal life that are ours in Christ. Help us to remember that we are never alone. That it is the living Christ who promises to transform us, to give us strength and courage to live out our faith, to be with us no matter where we are and what we're going through. We are not alone. So may the spirit of the living Christ work in us and through us, bringing new life and new joy and new peace. In the name of our risen Lord, we lift up to you our prayers for those who are hurting and grieving, those who are facing difficult choices and decisions. We lift up to you those on our prayer list. We lift up to you those we have named out loud this day. We lift to you those that remain in the silence of our hearts. Knowing that your spirit is there to bring healing and wholeness and comfort and that peace that surpasses all understanding. So Lord, continue to strengthen us this day so that we might be bold proclaimers of the good news that Jesus was dead, but it now is alive. Help us to share this good news with our broken and hurting world, and may our daily living be a testimony to you and your place in our lives. May we rise up from the ordinariness of our lives and walk with Christ all of our days. This we ask in the name that is above all names, for we pray in the strong name of Christ Jesus, our risen Lord and our risen Savior, who invites us to pray when we gather the prayer he taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. My friends, we have been given the most wonderful, most precious gift the world has ever known, the gift of God's only Son our risen and reigning Lord. And God simply asks us to take from the gifts, other gifts that God has given us and share those gifts so that God's kingdom and God's will might be done right here and right now. So let us give and give with generous hearts.
let us pray together. Eternal God, we praise you for calling us into new life in Jesus' name. By your spirit, help us to follow Christ's example of selfless service so that our lives may be signs of his life and all we do may show forth your love. Amen. Our closing hymn, The Day of Resurrection. risen. Let us go forth to be those two bits in the world to complete Mark's gospel, to share the good news, the wonderful news that God's love is stronger than everything else, even death itself. And as we do this, the blessings of God the Father, the blessings of God the risen Son, and the blessings of God the Holy Spirit will continue to watch over you, protect you, and strengthen you this day and every day. And all God's people shall say,